morning to everyone. It's great to see you. Uh, we thank our worship leaders for guiding us today and just establishing the atmosphere. And we can go ahead and get into what I would have for us. We're going to start in James 1.25 today. Talk about the perfect freedom of Christ. The one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty. Now, this is a, in just this one verse, there is so much depth here. Uh, James uses the word paracuto for looks when looking into, and it literally means to stoop down, to lean over, to peer within. Metaphorically, it means carefully look into or inspect curiously. So it's a word picture, and you can imagine this. It's, it's like someone stooping over to see what's in a well or is stooping down to investigate something on the ground or something that's very interesting, but you need to take a deeper look at it. So that is a, an intentional effort to soak in the Word of God, look in the Word of God, think about the Word of God, to, to peer into it. Perfect is teleos, and it means complete, finished, full of age, full grown, and mature. So that perfect law of God, it is completely mature. And when we peer into it, and we continue to peer into it, it has that impact on us. It matures us also. Law is namas, and it means anything established, anything received by usage, a custom, a law, or a command. And so we know God's truth is established. Liberty here, and some translate it freedom. It goes both ways. It's really effectively synonymous. It's eleutheria, and it's freedom, legitimate license to do as one wills. So the one who peers into, looks over into the deep well of the complete, mature uh, commands of God, law of God, truth of God, which is the law of freedom. It's the law of liberty. And that's something that you need to remember because God's word is freedom to you. There's no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. So there's never a point in the life of a believer when the word is God is going to condemn you. So if you're feeling or sensing guilt or condemnation, you're not hearing Holy Spirit. That's not the word of the Lord to you. As we've discussed before, it doesn't mean that the Lord doesn't correct us. He certainly does. But correction is not condemnation. And correction is not guilt. Even when we've gotten off into the weeds, even when we've chosen to make a decision that would be sinful. And remember, sin in Greek literally means to miss the mark. Hamartia. So when you miss the mark and you're off in the weeds and Holy Spirit speaks to you about that, that's not condemnation. That's not guilt. He's not bringing you down. It's motivated by his love. He's simply offering you the guidance to get you back into the place of blessing. So when you continue to peer into and you remain in that place that brings freedom, it yields freedom in your life, and it's legitimate license, total liberty, and it produces a poetic life. So the one who looks into that perfect law and perseveres in it, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Now, perseveres there is parameno, and meno is to abide, para is alongside. So it literally means to remain beside, to continue to abide. Figuratively, it means to be permanent, to persevere, to survive, to stay alive. And really, that's what it happens for us when we choose to peer into the Word of God. When we remain in that place, we keep our eyes fixed on Him, fixed on His truth. It's transforming to us. It, it yields that freedom in us. It causes us to stay alive, if you will. Uh, that's what it drives us. That's what compels us. Doer is koietes, and it means a maker, producer, author, doer, performer, or a poet, and you can see that's where we get our English word for poet. Poetes come from the Greek for poet. And blessed is makarios, and it's supremely blessed. By extension, it means fortunate or well-off. It also carries the idea of happiness, joyfulness. So the follower of Christ who intentionally and carefully peers into God's perfect law of freedom then chooses to remain next to it and acts on what he or she sees becomes a poet of God's truth and is supremely blessed through the freedom in Christ 
he or she lives. You, he causes you to live a poetic life. It's a beautiful life lived before others. You know, John's gospel in, in Gina's group, we we're studying through that. And when you read John 1, the first 18 verses is a poem. It's prose. He begins his work with a poem. So John's life had become poetic. And here's this fisherman, this former fisherman writing poetry about Jesus. And he was living. His life was a poem before the people, a beautiful life. And so that will produce a poetic life for others to read, others to see. And we're free to be God's children. Now, we hear this mentally and we ascend to it. But the Lord wants us to appropriate this into our spiritual DNA. He wants us to know this, live this. This needs to be your nature. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There's no longer Jew or Greek. There's no longer slave or free. There's no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So in Jesus Christ, salvation is eternally more than avoiding destruction. It becomes clear that we're all free to be fully adopted and restored as God's children. The Lord's heart is grieved, I know, when we don't get to this place in our hearts and minds, when we don't fully see ourselves as his dearly, perfectly loved children, bearing his name, clothed in Christ with all the rights and all of the, the freedom that Yeshua lives. Because Christ's freedom is our freedom. Does Christ walk in guilt? No, he does not. Does Christ have perfect freedom to come to his Father? Yes, he does. And he is the heir of all things, and in him we share in that. And Christ died for us that we would know this and live this. And it's a grief to him. It's a grief to Abba. It's a grief to Holy Spirit when we miss the mark, when we fall short on that, when we stay over in the weeds, when our life is still remains in a cycle of just beating ourselves up over sin or our lack or our inability, all those natural things that we bring to the table. And the Lord is saying, I've taken care of all of that. You're now a daughter of God. You're now a son of God. And when you peer into that, when you, again, keep that mental picture of looking over, taking, making the intention of stooping over and bending over to look down into the deep well, the endless well of God's love and God's truth, it transforms you. And if that's your focus, you're going to be motivated by that truth. You're not going to be motivated by guilt and shame and repetitive cycles and all the things that the enemy would have you focus upon which keeps you over here in the weeds, and it minimizes the life that you already have. You are fully a son or a daughter of God. You know, I've shared with you before, I'm an adopted child. Uh, I, when I was born, I did not have my father's name. I, I did not have the inheritance of my family. I didn't have any of that, but I was fully and legally adopted into my father and mother's family. And they love me so deeply that there is no part of me that does not think that I'm fully their, their son. There's no, there's, no, uh, there's no part of me that does. And everything that belongs to my parents belongs to me. That inheritance, everything is there. There's no part of me that doesn't see that, doesn't appropriate that. And how much more so is that true for the, our adoption as sons and daughters of God? Because we, none of us were his children before we came to Christ, before his spirit entered us and regenerated us. But once that happened, once that happened, we took on his name. We took on his likeness. We were clothed in Christ. We were fellow heirs with our brother, Jesus, Yeshua. And so everything that's his, he shares with us. We have full rights to it without any hindrance whatsoever. And the Lord wants us to understand that. In Jesus Christ, we are completely, perfectly free to be God's children. And if you'll soak in that truth, it'll transform your heart today. It absolutely will. It will be the protection at the door. It will keep the enemy from lying to you and you believing it. It, it, will, it will heal your heart and it will strengthen you. It doesn't necessarily change your external circumstances, but it changes you in them. And you know, I'm a daughter of God. 
I'm a son of God. I'm a, I'm a brother to Yeshua. I'm a little brother to Yeshua. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. And all of his rights and privileges are mine. He gave that to me, and those are my possession now in him. We're free to be God's children. Again, what a pathetic view of Jesus if all we see him as is a way not to be destroyed. What a terribly pathetic view, and what an insult to him. And that orientation toward hell or destruction and just getting away from that. What, what a horrible way to look at our salvation in him. But to look directly at him and realize our focus is the glory of Christ, the glory of God, and being a daughter of God and a son of God is transforming. And God's children are free. We're free to be God's children, and God's children are free. In Matthew 17, 25 through 26, what do you think, Simon? From whom do kings of the earth take toll or tribute? From their children or from others? When Peter said, from others, Jesus said to him, then the children are free. And free there is Eleutheros, and Eleutheria, or Eleutheria is freedom or legitimate license, and this is being free, Eleutheros, which is freeborn, a full citizen, unrestrained, completely at liberty. So the children of God live in the fullness of the freedom that the rights of heirship in Christ hold. And this is a fact. This is God's truth to us today. God's children are completely free. Well, we're free to be confident before him. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us, through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and that's what guilt is, an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Remember, confession in Greek is homologeo. It means to say the same thing as we're saying the same thing about ourselves that God is saying. The confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Confidence there is parousia, and it means outspokenness, bluntness, no concealment. By implication, it's a boldness, a confidence, a fearlessness. So the writer to the Hebrews is telling us that in Jesus Christ, we have a confidence to come before Abba with boldness. Now, this is not arrogance, to be sure, but it's a confidence that we are fully received. There's no fear there. There's no shame there. there, there there's no dread there. There's no condemnation there. You can come boldly, confidently into the presence of the Most High God, who is your Father, and you can speak to him. You can share with him what's on your heart. You can share with him when you're angry. You can share with him when maybe you're a little mad at him. He's big enough to handle it. You know, whatever is going on in you, you can have the confidence that you're not going to be condemned for that and that he is our loving father and he desires your presence. He desires you to be before him. And there is no guilt or shame in that. There's no reason to, to shrink back or fear or dread or uh any of the things that would hinder us or hold us. Because when we're doing that, we're not agreeing with Jesus. We're not agreeing with the truth. We've ceased to peer into and abide by the truth, that deep well of the truth. But when we're doing that, we understand that we can come before Father without fear or condemnation or judgment because Jesus took that upon him on the cross. All of your sin, all of your shame, all of your guilt, all of your flaws, all of your failings, Christ took all of that upon himself, and he paid the price for it, and he wiped it clean. And so when Abba sees you, he sees his son. And so you can have that confidence. So we're free to be confident before him. We're free to be courageous. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are 
children of God. Romans 8, 15, 16. 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. So remember, courage is not the absence of the spirit of fear, but the power to choose faith and strength in God's love. Courageous people actually feel fear. You're not courageous if you don't. I mean, if something doesn't make you afraid, well, then it doesn't require any courage to face it, does it? So for some people, that just doesn't cause them any fear. There are situations they can go into, and for whatever reason, they it just doesn't cause them to be afraid. Well, they're not courageous. You look at them and you go, oh, wow, that's a courageous person. He or she is doing something I, I would be afraid to do. Not necessarily. If they're not afraid to do it, they're not courageous. <laughs> they're just doing what they do. So have that lie removed. Actually, it's when you feel fear and you do it anyway, that's courage. And so we have the freedom to be courageous by the Spirit of God within us. And courage is different for different people. Different circumstances require uh, those different uh, responses from us. We're free to be motivated by love. For the love of Christ compels us. Since we have reached this conclusion that one died for all, and therefore all died, and he died for all so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for the one who died for them and was raised. From now on, then, we do not know anyone from a worldly perspective. What compels there is suneko, and it literally means to hold together. By implication, it means to arrest, to pre preoccupy, to be taken with. Uh, that's translated different ways as your Bible may have uh, for the love of Christ constrains us or the love of Christ controls us. I don't really like the word control. Um, I, I get what that's saying, but it sounds a bit dubious. Control seems to kind of have a dark connotation to it. You know, you're just controlled by everything. I like compels in English better uh, because it's it's a motivation that we're we're driven by, we're compelled by love. We're not controlled by it. Uh, because it's a choice we make. But remember this, uh, agape love is not an emotion. It, it is a choice that we make. Agape love is God's love, so it's perfect love. And loving someone with agape love uh, doesn't require that you like that person, by the way. It doesn't mean that emotionally you're drawn to them or that you actually enjoy being around them or enjoy that person because they might not be very enjoyable at all. But we're compelled by love because we're not viewing them through natural eyes anymore. We're seeing the value and the potential in this very arrogant person or this very unpleasant person. And we're making a decision that's for their benefit. That's what agape love is. That's what Yeshua did for us on the cross. See, his emotions, his human emotions were screaming at him, don't do this. There, there's nothing in the natural person that wants to be tortured to death or be rejected by the ones that he or she loves. There, there's nothing in our human makeup that desires that. There was nothing in his physical body that wanted to experience that kind of pain. So everything in the natural was screaming at Yeshua, don't do this. And he even told his father, he even told Abba, Abba, if there's any other way that the plan could be affected without doing this. Could we do this? Nonetheless, not my human will, but your will be done. That's agape love. And that's forgiving us from the cross in this place where he's being tortured to death. And he's forgiving those around him who are mocking him, who are laughing at him or jeering. Uh, that's love. There is nothing in the, his natural emotion that enjoyed being there. But he saw the value in the potential children of God around him. And he saw us and he said, they're worth it and I'm going to do this. So he was compelled by love to do what he did. And so if we do things out of guilt uh, or out of routine, uh, we're in that moment, we're not operating by the spirit of God. And it gives us the ability by Holy Spirit when we're around those unpleasant people and I'm not thinking of anybody in particular, so nobody's coming to mind. But there are unpleasant people we have to deal with on a regular basis. 
And when we're walking in his spirit and we're peering into the well of his truth and we're living by his love, then we're able, we're by his spirit able to say, this person has to be the most unpleasant individual on the face of the earth. But there is potential here and God wants to reach that potential. And so I'm going to choose by his spirit and by his truth to see that value. And I'm going to make my decisions based upon that. And so that's key. The love of Christ compels us to do what we do because that's how he lived it. To reflect his glory, we're free to reflect his glory. We're not like Moses who used to put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from gazing steadily until the end of the glory of what was being set aside. That's an unusual phrasing there, just seeing the depth of that glory, the completion of it. Where, where does this lead, the end of it? Um, until the end of the glory of what was being set aside. But their minds were hardened because, again, they were living religiously. They were living naturally. For to this day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains. It's not lifted because it's set aside only in Christ. So what we see here is Paul's talking about particularly the Jews, the, the Old Covenant. You know, you have these two worlds colliding. You still have Jews who were living under the old covenant, uh, Jews who were used to the temple, used to uh, the feasts and festivals and all those things, which were ordained by God, but they had not received Yeshua. They had not accepted him as their Messiah. And therefore, Paul is saying the veil still remains over them. They're still natural minded. They can't see it. They can't understand the glory of God. So still today, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. Whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, eleutheria, liberty. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We all with unveiled faces are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord who is the Spirit. Now, image, here's the word icon, where we get our English word icon. Now, it literally means an image, a likeness, and it's, it's key to understand in the Greek, it means a portrait or something directly derived from what it represents. Now, this is different, really, in our usage. We, we have icons today. Uh, we have logos today. Logos is what that is. It's a word about. That's where we get that from the Greek as well. But our use of icon today is different from this because, like for instance, Beaten Bow Homes, we all recognize the BH and the doors and we get that it represents this business, this ministry. But it's not actually an icon in the sense of the Greek because it doesn't represent this company. Those two doors in the BH is not directly derived from I mean, you can look at that. And we know what it means, but a B and an H and two doors, that's not our business, and that's not uh, a picture of who we are. It just represents it. You see what I'm saying? Now, in the Greek, an icon is something like when Christ said, whose image is on this coin? There was actually an image that looked like Caesar. It was derived directly from him. So you could look at the image and say, okay, that's what Caesar looks like, you know, to the best you can, to the degree that it could. Or if you looked at um, a sunset over water and you saw that reflection, that would be an icon because it's not the sun, but it's directly derived from it. And so it looks like the sun. So that's the deeper word there in the original Greek. And that's what's being said about us. So we're not just a logo. You know, we actually look like Yeshua in increasing measure when we fix our eyes on him and we allow his truth to transform our hearts. We are directly derived from the one whom we represent, and we reflect that glory. We're free to be wise. Where's the one who's wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, through the world's wisdom, you don't, you don't achieve God mentally or you don't ascend to him through your intellect. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Jews demand the signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly 
to the Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. The wise there is sophos, and we know sophia is wisdom, and be wise is sophos, and it means clear, skilled in learning, actions, or plans. And so what we see here is that it's only through intimacy, receiving Yeshua for who he is, that you can understand the truth. And the fear of God, the reverence for God, is the beginning of wisdom. And it doesn't matter how intellectual one may be, and the Greeks were high intellects, they could not achieve God. It didn't matter how smart they were, how learned they were, they could not achieve God. And the Greeks took human thought to its apex. Uh, we have not surpassed that. We have more information than they had, but we're not more intelligent than they. We're still using the categories that the Greeks developed in our university system. We still use uh, their terminology, and we still put the frames on it uh, in the Western Hemisphere that they developed long ago, centuries ago. So we have not surpassed them in intellect. We just have more information, more technology than they had. But they had taken intellect to its apex, and yet they could not achieve God. And when they're hearing about this Messiah who dies on a cross for us, it's folly to a lot of them. They think that's ridiculous, that's stupid. And so many of them missed it. And the same thing with the Jews, they were thinking, they were offended that their Messiah could come and, and be stripped naked and beaten half to death and then crucified on a cross. That's our Messiah? That, that was a stumbling block for them. They just couldn't accept that because they were determined to stick to their religious view, many of them. And they died in that. So wisdom comes, that true wisdom, that clarity comes only through intimacy with Yeshua. But we're free to be wise. We now are the ones who can see clearly. Paul talked about in um, 1 Corinthians 3 that people without the Spirit just can't discern the things of God. It's not possible for them. So again, that's also another reason for us to be patient with those who are outside of Christ. I've shared with you my former next-door neighbor years ago in Louisiana used to say, hey, don't spank a dog for being a dog. Dogs do what dogs do. There are certain behaviors that you can't train out of them because that's what they are. They're a dog. So don't expect them to get, get up in the morning, get dressed, put on pants, and walk around and talk because they're, they're, they can't do that. And I thought, you know, that's so true. And Holy Spirit was saying, you know, Marcus, that's true for those outside of me. Don't spank them for being lost because they're lost. Don't don't be frustrated at the fact that they act lost because they are lost and they're not able to make good decisions. They're not wise and they're not going to be wise until they receive Yeshua. But children of God are free to be wise. We're actually the ones who are gifted in Holy Spirit, not because we're more intelligent, not because we're better people inherently, but because we have Yeshua and we are children of God. Now we're the ones who see clearly because of him. We're free to be exponential. You know, this is the famous story of the feeding of the multitude in John 6, 9, and 11. There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. And we know that there was also leftovers as well. And this may have been upwards of 20,000 people. There were 5,000 adult males, but there may have been up to 20,000 people there when you count women and children also. And then there were leftovers? Wow. In John 14, 12, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do because I'm going to the Father. So what Yeshua was saying is, is, you see what I'm doing, what Holy Spirit is doing with me, and, and we're in partnership in this. And by his power, uh, I'm accomplishing these things. And he said, these are some wild things for sure. But he said, even greater things, more exponential things are going to be occurring. He says, I'm going to the Father's right hand, and Holy Spirit's going to be poured out upon my brothers and sisters. And this thing is going to become exponential. So not only are there going to be more people doing what I'm doing, but they're going to be doing even greater things because the, the tandem of me being at the Father's right hand and then pouring out this ability by Holy Spirit is going to be even greater than what you're experiencing right now. He's saying that to his original followers. Well, that's us. That's us in our time. So in Jesus Christ, 
as God's children, we're free to be exponential. Now, God is the one who brings that increase, but we walk in that and we become vessels of that. And God begins to touch that. And we've had so many testimonies here in this ministry. Uh, I've heard Cal say many times, the math is just not there. We, we, we can't figure out how our, the economics of the company are working like they are. It's not natural. It's not normal. You, you can't get an accountant out and say, well, it's because of this, this, and this, or these are the factors around. It's just, wow, what's going on? Well, that's God. And so we're free to be exponential because we are children of God. And as long as we focus upon that and give him the glory and give this business back to him every single day, then we can just watch him work. And so in Jesus Christ, we're free to be exponential because he's the one who brings that increase. And ultimately this, as God's children, we're free to be like Yeshua. We're free to be exactly like him. I'm not talking about equal to him. We don't become God. But we're exactly like him in heart and character and purpose. In Galatians 2.20 in the Jubilee Bible, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, I chose the Jubilee Bible there because uh, that's translated a couple of ways. Some say faith in the Son of God. And while we do have faith in the Son of God, what's actually being rendered there in the Greek is you're living by the faith of the Son of God. In other words, you're walking with the same faith Yeshua had. He gives you the ability to do that in Holy Spirit. So, yes, we have faith in Jesus, Yeshua. But more than that, we're given the faith of Jesus. So we can actually live as he lived. And Holy Spirit can accomplish through us what he accomplished through Yeshua when we're agreeing with him, when we're seeing things, when we're walking. See, there was never a moment, there was never a fraction of a second when Yeshua did not accept the fact that he was the son of God. You know, he's not wandering around as he's talking to the disciples going, am I really the son of God? I don't know. He knew who he was. And so that drove, his identity drove everything that he did. Well, in him, we're given the faith of the Son, and he's desiring, he's asking us, he's wanting us. He died for us, and he lives for us that we would have the same faith he had as he walked the earth. And we would know, I'm a daughter of God. I don't doubt that. I, I, don't, I don't listen to the voices or spirits that would say otherwise or would try to minimize that. I'm a son of God. I have full rights of inheritance. I'm a friend of Holy Spirit. I can be a vessel of the power of God just like Yeshua because of him, because I'm clothed in him. He lives within me. He's transformed me. I'm his sister. I'm his brother. I have the right of inheritance. And there's nothing now blocking my relationship with Abba Father. I have direct access to the most holy place in the third heaven in Yeshua. There's nobody who would say Jesus doesn't deserve to be there or belong there. There's nobody who would say he doesn't have the right to come before the Father anytime he wants to. Nobody would say that. Well, he's saying to us, you don't say that about yourself because you're in Yeshua. You're not there by your own righteousness because you don't have any. You're there by Christ's righteousness. So for you to say, I don't belong there or I don't have a right to be there, then you're saying Yeshua doesn't. Now, it may not be what you intend, but that's what you're saying. Or you're saying, I'm not really connected to Yeshua, or Yeshua's uh, work on the cross wasn't enough, or his blood didn't cleanse me, or the word is not true, ultimately. But that's not the case. So we are free to be like Yeshua. The complete Jewish Bible renders it this way. When the Messiah was executed on the stake as a criminal, I was too, so that my proud ego no longer lives but the Messiah lives in me, and the life I now live in the body, I live by the same trusting faithfulness that the Son of God had, who loved me and gave himself up for me. We are free to be like Yeshua. Our Father, in Yeshua's name, in your Holy Spirit, 
We thank you so much for this word of liberty, this word of truth. And Lord, you're causing us, you're calling us today to, to bend down, to peer into, to bend over, to look deeply into the well, that never-ending well of your truth. And Lord, when we do this, and as you said through James, when we choose to remain next to it, when we choose to abide in that place, when we don't take our eyes off this truth, it transforms us by what we see. And more and more, we become like that image. We become like the image of Yeshua. And so we directly represent Yeshua in the earth. Father, we thank you for this. And right now, today, Lord, we decree and declare that we are refusing, we reject any spirit, any word, anything that disagrees with this truth. When we hear a word of condemnation, whether it comes from within us or from without we reject that because we know that's not truth. And Father God, we know that we have been cleansed. We have been made whole. We've been given rights as sons and daughters of God. And Father, we know that you desire for us to come into your presence. You look forward to us. You long for us to come before you with confidence, knowing that we are fully welcomed there. We're fully desired there. And in Jesus Christ, we actually have the right to be there. And that's astounding to us, but it's your truth. And so, Father, today and from this day forward, may we choose to walk in your freedom. Father, thank you. And we want to live that poetic life because when we do, we are a poem to be read, a song to be sung all around us. Father, people see the difference. They see Christ. They see the image of Christ, the likeness of Christ flowing through us. And that desire grows within them. They're compelled. They're drawn to you in that. So, Father, we, we put away the guilt. We put away the shame. We put away the focus on the sin cycles and the beating ourselves up and staying off in the weeds. And we walk now fully today in the light of Yeshua, clothed in him, cloaked in him, fully adopted as daughters and sons of God, full rights of inheritance, our focus on you, nothing hindering us, walking in power, walking in truth, walking in life, representing you wherever we go, that you would be glorified, your purposes would be accomplished, and it would become more and more exponential every single day. You died for us that this would be possible. You live for us that this is true. And we praise you for that, Yeshua. It is in your name and in your Holy Spirit we pray. Amen. Grace and peace to you today.